What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Nara and Uzumaki? Part 9. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Of course, injuries heal much faster for chakra users than ordinary people, but that's no reason to ignore people's health. The overwhelming majority of fighters with such cases were transferred from the wind country to this front after Suna's capitulation, without any rest or with very short breaks of one or two weeks at most. In principle, considering recent losses and the significant depletion of medical ninjas in the destruction of the main camp, these actions are justified. But why send those who are already recovering or fully healed instead of those who are poorly treated and haven't had a chance to rest? Moreover, there are too few reinforcements from non-clan and clans like Sarutobi and Yurin. There seems to be no grounds to accuse Hokage based solely on suspicions, but considering the consequences, Hiruzen is contributing to the natural weakening of clans. And there's no trace of faceless boys from Danzo around. There were rumors around the village that after an operation, the old one-eyed prick is rebuilding the strength of his ANBU branch, but unfortunately, I couldn't find out anything concrete. In any case, it's essential to take my safety seriously, not suppress my sensor feelings even in my sleep, and prepare escape routes just in case. I'm not gonna die for some mythical will of fire, even if it means abandoning my teammates. Only Saya can count on such sacrifice, and as for everyone else, I largely don't care. This will be my guiding principle in the days to come. First, this is the fifth. Suddenly the earpiece of the radio came alive, and I grimaced in anticipation of news from the second team, which included Huga. During a war, there are no good news, especially during the first patrol. And after chatting a bit with recent patients, I confirmed my suspicions. Losses and injuries occur quite often on this front, and in the last month, the camp lost a third of its 50-person complement, which is why reinforcements were sent here. Enemy shinobi detected moving towards our position. Fifth, this is the first, what's the enemy's strength? Immediately responded, the Uchiha Jounin assigned to our teams as the leader. Nine individuals, judging by their chakra levels, three of them are Jounin, and the rest are Chunin. They are approximately six kilometers away, but closing in fast. Three teams. This is bad. Retreat towards our position, and we'll prepare a few traps in the meantime. Frown the Jounin. Roger. Heard that? He turned towards us. We're moving behind that hill and preparing a warm welcome for these earthworms. Silently nodding, we followed him. Unfortunately, the grass territory lacks the familiar forests for Kanoha's shinobi, with almost the entire area consisting of numerous gentle hills overgrown with bushes, or flat land with thick grass reaching an adult's waist or even shoulder height in some places. This complicates both orientation and preparation for the upcoming battle. But that didn't stop our leader from setting up several mechanical traps between two hills and right in front of them. I doubt the Jounin will fall for such a primitive setup, but it might catch some of the Chunin off guard. I also contributed by sacrificing a dozen seals in the most convenient spots. Powerful electric discharges may not do much harm, but they will significantly slow down even those with a large amount of chakra. And the exploding kunai underfoot will cause quite a few unpleasant moments. Just as I was finishing preparing surprises with the Uchiha, the second team consisting of Hyuga, Senju and Abiram, who were about five years older than us, finally joined us, and I managed to detect several merged sources of chakra right on the edge of my sensitivity. Senpai, they've noticed us. Warned the white-eyed ninja from the clan's side branch and they're moving straight towards this direction. Damn it, and a sensor too. Judging by the displeased look on the Jounin's face, it was clear he didn't rate our chances of avoiding losses very highly. All right, the traps offer some hope, but even minor injuries to the enemy will work in our favor. I won't hide it, but with three Jounin I can handle at most two so someone will have to take on another while the rest push back the Chunin. Otherwise, the enemy will overwhelm us with numbers as soon as they manage to disable even one of our fighters. 
Glancing at my teammates, I stepped forward simultaneously with Senju, causing our senpai to raise an eyebrow questioningly. Clearly, he knew what the shinobi from the other clan were capable of, but he had doubts about me. I have four class B missing means to my name, I explained simply and briefly. Activating the Sharingan for a moment and scanning me, the Uchiha nodded approvingly. While it's not easy to gauge chakra reserves just by the number of seals on clothing and skin, it was evident that not every Jounin had such a reserve. And surely, he had glanced at my dossier at least briefly. Take a minute to prepare and take your positions. You all know how to fight in teams, so stick together and don't let the enemy use their numerical advantage against you. Yes, senpai. Nodding to us, the guys from the second team checked their gear and climbed to the top of the right hill. Take care not to die out there, muttered the grim-faced Tsum, patting me on the shoulder before heading up the left hill with her dog. Don't worry, I'll send a clone with you just in case. I reassured Ishii, who was noticeably nervous. Indeed, killing off fairly weak and disorganized missing means was one thing, but dealing with a battle-tested team from the enemy village without our strongest partner was quite another. The main thing is to hold out until we deal with our opponents and come to help you. The guy nodded and hurried with my bunshin after Inazuka. Meanwhile, I advanced towards the Jounin, positioning myself slightly ahead of the line of traps. There's no time to devise a complicated plan. So as soon as the enemy appears in sight, we retreat and try to lead them into our surprises, then attack with ninjutsu right away. Giving instructions, the shinobi didn't even turn to me, scanning the space ahead with his fully activated Sharingan. Three Tomo in each eye. Ready for airborne fire? I received a quick glance for my response. Familiar with the combination? Trained in the team? Hmm, that's good to hear. Let's go with that plan. Senpai, they'll be here in a minute, and the Chunin teams are flanking while all three Jounin are coming straight at you. The radio earpiece came alive. And judging by my senses, the six Chunin were slightly below Ishii's level, so we should handle them without much trouble. Since the Founder Clan took over training, our shinobi's level has significantly risen compared to that under IWA, who preferred quantity, saving their strongest fighters for tackling areas of the greatest resistance. Understood. If possible, don't deliver the finishing blow, I recalled, addressing the neighboring ninja with a questioning smirk. I need them for training and I don't want to risk our own. Understood. For some time, we simply stood silently, tense and scanning the enemy. Or rather, the red-eyed neighbor was doing the scanning, while I could sense the approach of nine sources of chakra. If two Jounin didn't pose much of a concern, the third shinobi among them stood out noticeably, not reaching Kaga level reserves but definitely not an ordinary fighter. In any case, our commander was outmatched in terms of chakra volume. Here they come. Achiha tensed. Indeed, I could already distinguish fleeting figures in the grass. Without waiting for them to approach, we hastily retreated and at the right moment activated the traps, creating a series of explosions and bursts of lightning-style chakra, in addition to physical attacks on the trio of enemy shinobi. After that, the Jounin began forming seals, followed by me. Katan, Dienden. Futan, Daitapa. Our quiet whisper was almost drowned out by the roar of flames, but the resulting enhanced wave of fire struck where Iwa's shinobi were moving. However, I doubted that we could easily get rid of the Jounin. Just moments before the traps triggered, I felt a solid surge of chakra, followed by an even larger one. Due to the amount of chakra used on both sides, it wasn't immediately clear what jutsu they had employed, but the towering flames encountering resistance clearly showed that our opponents were far from weak. Anticipating what we would see when the smoke and dust settled, I began forming the next series of seals. Chidori Senban and I also silently rejoiced that I stood slightly behind Uchiha and hadn't allowed him to copy the technique. The projectiles launched from lightning style easily pierced through the earth wall that had appeared, slightly singed. A faint cry indicated that at least one Senban had found its mark. Simultaneously, I sensed our and the enemy Chunin engaging in combat using their techniques. However, it was becoming dangerous to be distracted further as three figures appeared atop the wall. Damn it! Uchiha cursed under his breath. Well, well, have we been lucky to stumble upon Kanoha rats? A rather colorful man with a completely bald head, 
more resembling a bear with his build than a human interjected. Even at a glance, he stood slightly over two meters tall and weighed about a hundred and a half kilograms of pure muscle. The narrow-eyed man with a small beard and a miniature woman with short dark hair and a cloth mask on her face on either side of him didn't make much of an impression. The latter, incidentally, had caught a senbon in her arm, judging by the twitch of her limb. And what brings Butcher go to here? Did they demote you to sabotage squads? The neighbor scoffed in response. Asked for it myself to avoid dying of boredom. Just didn't expect to meet Shigeru Uchiha himself in such a hole. The bald man grinned menacingly. In Iwagakure, your head is valued very highly. And I intend to collect. Kanoha and Suna bounty hunters have quite a reward for you too. The Jounin grinned back and turning to me for a moment. Asked, Ryo, can you handle two of them? Assessing the opponents and their somewhat battered condition from the triggered traps. I nodded. Fighting two Jounin was certainly different from dealing with a pair of Chunin and a Jounin's underling. But considering the cards I had up my sleeve, the odds were decent not only to await backup but also to take them down myself. My red-eyed friend, take care of the second one. Gotu roared and quite agilely for his size, lunged towards the retreating neighbor. I got the narrow-eyed one and the kunoichi. They didn't waste any time either rushing forward. As I jumped back from a few shurikens and kanai from the woman, I noted the man's tanto. From the looks of it, this couple knows how to work together. While the kunoichi was swiftly throwing iron at me, she'd have turned me into an iron hedgehog by now. Preventing me from using the jutsu, the shinobi was closing the distance to chop the victim into small pieces. And judging by the confidence of their actions, such tactics worked without fail even against high-level enemies. Not this time. Before the narrow-eyed man could reach me, I threw a sheet of kanji barrier on the ground a little behind me, closing the few in jutsu. Saichu Raku Kengoku, prison lightning barrier, prepared beforehand. The kunoichi who was keeping a considerable distance remained outside the barrier. But the swordsman was inside with me, one on one. That's what I wanted. Taking out a kanai as a distraction, I waited until he was a couple of meters away and used kagehame no jutsu almost up close. This trick worked on almost every missing nin, but this time the jonin was too experienced and jumped back, increasing the distance between us. I had a backup plan for this one. I threw the kanai and simultaneously opened my palms forward and fired the seals. The first projectile the surprised narrow-eyed man was able to fend off, but he didn't have time to react to the next ones. The shuriken aimed at his throat only scraped his shoulder, but the practically invisible sunbon sank into the man's thigh, almost all the way into the flesh. I couldn't hold back a gloating smirk. The sealed weapon was personally infused with a very nasty poison that killed in a dozen minutes and, in the process, caused muscle cramps and general weakness. But most importantly, the effects of getting into the bloodstream are instantaneous. And judging by the hardened face of the jonin, he realized it almost immediately. Yes, my current opponent is fast, but I'm still a bit faster even without chakra feeding my body. Throwing a glance at his partner, who was trying to break the barrier with a one-handed ninjutsu, I unsheathed my katana and rushed forward without wasting any time. It was a good time to test my skills with a sword without being in much danger. Kenjutsu? The shinobi spoke for the first time, making sure there were no new attempts to catch him in the shadows. Kenjutsu. I nodded and jerked closer to deliver a horizontal strike at chest level, changing the blade's movement at the last moment. Jonin reacted and drew back, not daring to block with his shorter tanto, but immediately stepped forward and struck my arms. I had to pull back with a swift retreating motion, slashing the narrow-eyed man on the shoulder. He had almost caught me, but my speed was faster. After exchanging a few more blows with my opponent and getting a couple of scratches on my arms from the chakra suddenly covering my tanto, like a little death surprise, I had to admit that I was a bit inferior to the man in terms of skill. If it weren't for the poison and the speed advantage along with the greater reach of his blows, he could have shredded me into little pieces, in kenjutsu. Noting that the narrow-eyed man was already starting to stagger within a minute of fighting, I infused my muscles with chakra and in one swift jerk severed first the weapon arm and then the head. No! A woman's high-pitched scream distracted me from the bloody fountain from her severed neck and forced me to turn my attention to the remaining opponent behind the barrier. 
Apparently, the Kunoichi cared about this man, because the hatred that distorted the rather pretty face, judging by the visible part of it, made me feel a little uncomfortable. Nevertheless, I didn't wait for the enraged Jonin to break the barrier with the thrown pieces of earth, but took action myself. Kunai Kage Bunshin no Jutsu. The Kunai sent flying, covered in lightning chakra, multiplied to a hundred yes, even though Ma didn't know the strong techniques of Raitun, but the skill in using lightning chakra with weapons is unforgivable, and a real wave crashed down on the wall of the barrier, next to which stood the opponent. I would have been crushed if I hadn't removed the barrier a moment before. So the Kunoichi had to use all her skill to avoid such a deadly rain that even hastily raised earth walls couldn't protect against. However, I wasn't aiming to win solely with that technique. Simultaneously with the launched Kanai, a thin shadow slid along the ground. Just at that moment, when the enraged Kunoichi, mourning her fallen comrade, dodged the last projectile, she landed right on the waiting thread of shadow, which instantly began thickening. Anger is a poor advisor in battle. Thank the gods, Mito drilled that into me well. Without wasting time, I ran towards the opponent mirroring my movements and with a single touch to her forehead, ensured she lost consciousness. I grabbed a scroll, placed my hand on the fallen Kunoichi to the seal, and channeled chakra, then quickly removed the scroll now sealed with the captive. After that, I created a couple of clones to assist both teams, and I hurried towards where the frenzy of chakra from using fire and earth techniques didn't even allow determining the condition of the fighters. Time to help the red-eyed commander, and something tells me the battle isn't going in his favor. But before I could take a couple of steps, memories came from the destroyed Kage Bunshin that was with my team. Along with this, I barely restrained the desire to smack myself in the face. How could Rotaro fall for such a cheap trick, especially from the last opponent? As a result, a severed arm and the clone's life in exchange for a finishing blow. Sighing, sent clones will help and patch up. I rush towards the explosions and the roar of stones, freely pumping chakra into my muscles. Forget about stealth. Any high-level fighter can feel me with two-thirds of my reserve even in the heat of battle. So now I don't need to conserve chakra. The lack of speed in a battle with Erang Shinobi, and judging by the mentioned bounty in the wanted book of every village, Taicho and Butcher fall into this category can cost a life at any moment, especially if you get under not only enemy fire but friendly fire as well. Sparring with Mido taught me a lot. Finding myself closer and breaking through the smoke spreading from the fire techniques into a larger scorched wasteland made by the brief battle, I spotted two Jounin who were currently some distance apart from each other. Without wasting time, I rushed towards the Uchiha who had begun to catch his breath. Mentally pleased with the greatly improved control, that allowed me to somewhat distinguish chakra signatures of individual personalities with unique Kekiai Genkai. Tai Cho, how are you? Taking a defensive position slightly in front and to the side of the commander, I allowed only a quick glance in his direction to assess his condition, almost entirely focused on the enemy who had interrupted the attack. Unfortunately, the initial expectations were correct. Achiha was significantly battered, visibly favoring his left side, alongside a noticeable gash along his left thigh. Clearly, he hadn't reacted in time to some Dotan technique. The reinforced vest saved his torso, leaving him with bruises and possible rib cracks, but there was no such protection on his leg. Numerous small wounds and torn clothes suggested that the enemy Jounin excelled in Taijutsu more than the proud bearer of the acclaimed Sharingan. Along with a high volume of chakra, it's been worse, but you arrived just in time, the shinobi replied evenly. So, it seems I shouldn't expect my teammates. The bald man shook his head, frowning at the clone I created, which began working on Uchiha's most serious wound. Irionin, who can handle the established pair of Jounin. Letting you get close might be too dangerous, but what about ninjutsu? Just as I felt the pressure of chakra from Goto increasing, I quickly began forming seals, sparing no effort in the process. Just when this ambal stomped the ground with force, sending a healthy chunk of earth flying up and then slamming into it with all his might, sending a heap of shrapnel our way, I spat water from my mouth, rapidly expanding it into a wall. Sujtin, Mizits and Heki. Instead of standing still, the technique surged forward like a wave, effortlessly absorbing the first blow thanks to the infused amount of chakra. Following that, the second technique flew. Raitun, Kangekiha. 
electrifying the water and allowing it to withstand the Dotan Chakra. Due to the relatively low complexity of Taijutsu and the use of fewer hand seals, I managed to execute the combo attack much faster than the usual 4 seconds required. Thus, the wall erected in the wave's path proved unable to withstand the pressure until the end. However, the Jounin behind it was no longer there. He had bounced further back, and the bald man's confident look was replaced with a healthy dose of concern. Despite the excellent opportunity to continue the attack, I stayed put. Protecting the commander was too tempting a target to leave uncovered, even with a busy clone not counting. Moreover, engaging alone with such a strong and experienced shinobi was too risky. Irionin and with Raitun, spat the Jounin, clenching and unclenching fists covered in stone with a creak. For now, the battlefield seems to be yours, but we will meet Shigeru Uchiha again. And you, red-haired one, I will remember. Throwing a literally murderous, thanks to chakra inhibition, glance in my direction, the man dived into the ground and quickly started moving towards the territory of a Wagakure. Next to me, Uchiha sighed in relief and relaxed a bit, deactivating the Sharingan as soon as he was sure the danger had passed. Lucky that Goto didn't dare to fight both of us and retreated. More like, he feared I would finish treating you before he could take advantage of your reduced mobility. I succinctly clarified, surveying what had once been part of the grass-covered plain. Smoking grass, traces of burns and explosions, piles of earth, and huge pits, puddles of mud and murky water from my technique. All this in just about five minutes of battle between two elite Jounin. Yeah, water tends to be gentler in its impact on the surrounding nature compared to fire and earth. That's it. I patched up the wound on your thigh quickly, but after returning to camp, come to me for further treatment, announced the clone, rising from his knees. Dealing with ribs will take longer, so you'll have to endure. Not just ribs, but hands too. Uchiha grimaced, carefully rolling up the sleeves of his vest and observing the large bruises beginning to form on the outer sides of his arms. If not for the powerful chakra reinforcement, I would now also have broken arms. Recalling the stone-covered fists of the giant shinobi, I involuntarily grimaced. Indeed, an ordinary chunin would break in half even catching one of those blows, if an A-rank shinobi received such injuries. Perhaps I could still engage in taijutsu against him without significant consequences, simply due to the advantage in overall strength of an Uzumaki, but others shouldn't attempt such tricks. So, the hands as well, nodded the clone. Seal the bodies. I tossed copies of the scroll until it dispersed and nodded at the commander's raised eyebrow. Yes, I handled both. He doesn't need to know that the lady remained alive, it might lead to attempts to take her back. And then what would you get back as legitimate prey, at least in general form? I'll need her to test some ideas, practice, and apply them first on less significant experimental subjects whose deaths won't be as important as immediately on Saya. Then let's check on the Chunin and help if necessary, sighed Achiha, forgetting that I am essentially a Chunin as well. Aha, uh -huh, if Jounin battles rarely last longer than three to five minutes, typically resulting in the inevitable death of one opponent or the hasty retreat of the weaker one, then the lower the rank, the longer the battles for everyone else. Each shinobi has their own trick. Take that narrow-eyed swordsman, for example. Under equal conditions, he would have sliced me into pieces in about a minute, if not less. Not to mention my share of unpleasant surprises. Unfortunately, my teammates can't boast about such things. I sent a clone to each of them, so they'll help and patch up if needed. I shook my head, following the Jounin. And how much will they do? Achiha skeptically snorted. Considering each has a chakra reserve comparable to an average Tokabetsu Jounin, they'll manage for support. Hmm. Nara Uzumaki. Ah. Yeah. Anyway, my partners are relatively fortunate. Rotaro only has a minor injury to his arm, but dealing with him with Tsum's clone support should be no problem. I informed the commander of the known information. And how did you find that out? Shigeru asked with interest. I had to sacrifice a Kage Bunshin to pull Ishii out from under a finishing blow, I explained, and all the information came to me. Useful technique. Just not for everyone. Minimal costs for a Kage Bunshin are roughly equal to the chakra volume of an experienced Chunin. I cooled his enthusiasm, hastily walking behind. There's no hurry anyway. 
Sensor abilities reported that all the Chunin had gathered at the spot where we parted ways just 10 minutes ago with my trio of clones and a couple additions. However, I have no intention of enlightening anyone about my knowledge. Yeah, even for me it would be wasteful during a battle. The commander shook his head, parting thick grass in our path. Clearly, he too realized that all the fights were over and hurrying was pointless now. Considering that the average Uzumaki child has reserves close to a Jounin's by the age of seven, I provided general knowledge about the clan of sealing masters. It suits only them. It also matters greatly the density of the user's chakra, but others need not know about that at all. Without moving at high speeds, we reached the others only after five minutes of leisurely walking and immediately confirmed that everyone remained intact and relatively alive. In other words, on a small trampled area, a makeshift field hospital was set up where all the injured received assistance from my clones, and a little aside, two unconscious Iwagakir Chunin, taken as prisoners, lay. Surprisingly successful outcome for the first deployment of reinforcements. The Jounin marveled. Receiving a report from Senju and inspecting all the wounded. Successful. A somewhat optimistic view of the outcome, considering two severely wounded, one nearly disabled, and minor injuries to the other two. Without me and the Huga and Aburame, they might not have made it back to camp, and Rotaro would have had to abandon his shinobi career. Exactly. Statistically, every sixth patrol loses half its members, and every tenth one is wiped out completely, Shigeru responded. In fact, against three Jounin and six Chunin, the latter was precisely what threatened us. All I could do was shake my head at that. I feel like I'll have quite a time ahead of me. Sighing, I decided to focus on my immediate duties and headed towards Inazuka with Karamaru. Their wounds may be minor, but they still need to be treated and bandaged, since we still have the journey back to camp ahead of us, and they won't be able to move independently for at least another day, even with my help. How are you? I asked my teammate, helping her remove her vest and outer clothing. Tolerable. Grimaced the kunoichi as the fabric passed over a deep scratch on her side. But Rotaro... He put himself at risk foolishly, simply underestimating the desperation of an opponent who realized defeat was imminent. I nodded, retrieving disinfectant from the field kit and treating minor wounds. But in a week, he'll be moving like new, if I have the time to attend to him. Indeed, an experienced Irionine can get someone back on their feet even after a severe injury like limb loss in about a week or two, with full mobility restored, rather than the usual month or two. But for the village, this isn't advantageous in terms of both time spent on one patient and purely economically, as it's much easier to heal a wound once and let the shinobi recover on their own. Considering the shortage of medical personnel, carelessly and hastily treated wounds are nothing out of the ordinary. If I didn't have the ability to use clones and enough chakra, I would achieve similar results, just not as quickly. All right, you can get dressed, I said, finishing up, and mentally chuckled shifting my focus to the dog. Fourteen years already, and he's barely grown to a second size, unlike my Biakugan wielding friend. Thank you. Nodding, I quickly glanced at the still slightly pinkish face of the girl, smiled, but said nothing, continuing my work. Boss, I'm running out of chakra, distractedly called out one of the clones a few minutes later, busy with Aburame. Considering it was the one dealing with the commander, there was nothing surprising about that. I'm coming. After tending to the last scratch on Karamaru's side, I hurried to assist. What's the problem? I didn't dare dispel the clone to avoid interrupting memory sorting, so I had to find out the old-fashioned way. The lung is punctured and the spinal column is slightly grazed, answered the Kagebunshin. The insects are helping with healing, but involuntarily drain any chakra, hence the issues. Got it. I'll take over. I nodded, activating the chakra scalpel technique. Don't dispel yet. Aburame hadn't fallen into my hands before, because their symbiotic insects handled even minor and medium injuries on their own. And carriers usually died from chakra depletion before reaching the hospital, so I had to work hard to prevent the Chunin from dying. But after half an hour, we were ready to move back to camp. Not least of all, my three sealed stretchers played a role. Ishii also had to be carried, as he had lost a fair amount of blood and passed out before the clone finished regrowing his arm. Yes, and as carriers again clones, but now water clones, as they are more economical. 
a week after such a successful or perhaps unsuccessful as I consider it myself patrol mission, during which I acquired three prisoners, though one had to be handed over to the authorities, and a few intact bodies, filled with concern for my primary profession, Shigeru approached me silently and handed me an open page of a softcover book. At first, I didn't understand what was going on, but a couple of seconds later I realized that on the second page of the photograph, a suspiciously familiar masked face in a hooded robe, half-mask covering the face, and clothes-fitting dark glasses with red eyebrows stood out on the pale skin staring at me. We picked this off a shinobi from a wagakure yesterday, explained Uchiha. Apparently, go to the butcher hasn't forgotten about you, staring blankly at the wanted poster. I could only express all the emotions swirling inside me in one simple word. F asterisk asterisk K. Ryo sensei, there's another badly wounded man coming in. Have them put him on that bed by the door, and while I'm at it, do some first aid. I said, keeping my eyes on the moaning shinobi, whose right side was a mess of blood and flesh with broken bones and limbs. I don't know about another wounded man but this one might not live to see the morning if we abandon him now. Okay, sensei. The Uchiha skulked outside and began giving orders to the men who were delivering another wounded man to the hospital. Somehow the Kunoichi who had dropped by a few times to improve her skills in the use of the mystic hand had become my apprentice and then my assistant as she gained experience. And there was a lot to gain. The result of our outing was not only my page in the search book with a reward of 200,000 Rio and basic information, but also more frequent raids of a Wagakure shinobi in our direction. More precisely, once again increasing in frequency, since after talking to a few of the camp's rare old-timers, I discovered that it was a constant practice of wave attacks by single groups looking to knock out the contingent of the stronghold before attempting to wipe it out. In the past, when there wasn't even a marginally competent medic here, the casualties were horrendous, as the wounded died without proper care before they could be taken to the main camp. Now I was taking care of them and the casualties were greatly reduced. Some were back in action in a couple days, and everyone else was sent to a normal main force field hospital once a week. I can't say I was able to save everyone, or even provide most of them with normal medical care like in Kanoha, but none of my patients died after treatment. Only before or during. And there were more such cases than when I worked in the village. Naturally, under such harsh conditions, I jumped at the chance to get an assistant with an iron grip and even got the post commander to stop Shifuyu from going on patrol like me. I suspect it was only because Ikisan had already recognized the drop in irreparable losses and the lack of disgruntled Achiha Jonin nearby. And thanks to me, the number of shinobi in the camp was growing steadily, despite the reduced losses and returning fighters, Reinforcements continued to arrive in the same quantity, constantly reducing the workload on everyone else and allowing the commander to distribute patrol shifts in such a way as to give his subordinates much-needed rest. I mean, not four hours of sleep and two for everything else, but a full 24 hours to recuperate. I suspect that our cunning commander is either not sending the right reports regarding our post, or that the main camp is so used to the constant losses on this section of the front that they have not seen fit to change the number of reinforcements sent. I'd had the idea that the post was just a place to grind up clan shinobi who didn't like it, but without clear evidence. Suspicions remain suspicions. But there had been very few clanless shinobi arriving in the last six weeks compared to everyone else, and I hadn't seen any Sarutobi here at all. I took a deep breath, wiped away the sweat on my forehead, and sank down heavily onto the crude artisanal stool that was replacing the furniture in the infirmary. The boy's life was out of danger so I could rest a while before I started on the next one. I collected the shattered bones and even fused them a bit so that they wouldn't separate from the movement, and repaired the most severe muscle injuries. The rest of the recovery and healing would have to be done by the shinobi's body. During my Irionin practice at the camp, I had to retrain myself to conserve chakra and only handle life-threatening injuries minimally, leaving everything else to the possibility of accelerated recovery for the shinobi. There's simply no other way, even with a substantial reserve of chakra at the Kage level, I wouldn't be enough for everyone at once. And yet, Ma even sent a letter with sealed paper upon my request to replenish the shop's assortment. Ryo sensei I'm finished. Shifuyu-chan, clean this up and administer a standard injection. I commanded, rising. It's much easier to stimulate the body with medicine than with medical chakra. Okay, I'm on it. 
After letting my apprentice through the narrow passage between the beds, just stone beers covered with thin blankets and sheets, I started examining the new patient. Achiha had already cleaned the open wounds and stopped the external bleeding, so I immediately addressed the most critical wound near the heart from the kunai. The blade had entered just a millimeter, which would have been deadly in other cases. The cracked skull with a shattered jaw and the superficial stab and slash wounds on the upper torso were less dangerous. Repairing the organ and dealing with the aftermath of internal bleeding didn't take much time, after which I started on the head. Stitching the other wounds and applying herbal-soaked bandages could be done later by my apprentice. Once I finish with this unfortunate chunin, I can examine the other patients and decide whom we can attempt to get back on their feet in these conditions, and who should be sent back to Kanoha for recovery. Another day as an irionine on the front. Emerging into the fresh air free of the scent of blood and medicine that had permeated the infirmary walls, I rubbed my face forcefully and took a deep breath. Only now, several months into my personal involvement in the war, did I begin to understand the feelings leanly had poured out that distant evening. Daily skirmishes, losses, vacant stares of comrades who, in their spare time, just sit on the ground staring into nothingness. Not uncommon cases of suicides by shinobi who lost all their partners, desertion by people who lost the will to fight for already dead friends and companions. A fairly closed society of not very sociable killers, not inclined to create numerous social ties like ordinary people, has its drawbacks and disadvantages that contribute to the development of various mental disorders and the overall deterioration of a person's roof. At least a normal and completely healthy person would not start tallying each killed enemy on their own skin or check the fact of their own existence by making kunai holes in themselves. I won't even mention nightmares and insomnia, bouts of unfounded paranoia, and other such minor quirks of the overwhelming majority of veterans. Killing a large number of one's own kind has never contributed to establishing mental equilibrium, even with all the preparation for it. Not that it has affected me, but looking at yet another corpse of a deceased patient, I feel nothing but indifference now not even fleeting regret. Another one fallen victim to this foolish war into which Kanoha was dragged. He's not the first, he won't be the last. But small flashes of annoyance when it turns out to be a cute girl genuinely please me, means I haven't completely hardened yet. Not that it happens often, I go all out in such cases to prevent it from happening. Right now, I just want to rest, not think about anything or chat with someone about unrelated topics. Glancing at the darkening sky, I looked back at the infirmary. Shifuyu-chan, will you watch over everything here with the guys without me? Okay, sensei. Where are you going? I'll rest for a couple of hours, and my partners should have returned from patrol by now. If anything, look for me at the tents. Stepping out onto the street, I made my way through the camp, nodding to familiar shinobi and kunoichi, who hurried about their business or simply relaxed near their sleeping spots. Some were drinking, some smoking. A small group played cards while others heated up simple dinners on portable stoves. Some cleaned their weapons or patched up torn and tattered clothes. Not everyone could afford multiple spare sets. In general, it was the usual life of soldiers at war, adjusted for local reality. However, the relaxed scene was disrupted for some by eyes darting in search of danger. Nervous hands twitching towards weapons at loud noises and tense muscles ready to spring into action at the first signs of an enemy. Shaking my head, I headed towards my partner's tents, near which a small campfire had already been lit in a pit, surrounded by familiar silhouettes of people and dogs. How did the sortie go? I casually asked Sum and Rotaro, settling down on the ground next to Inazuka. We ran the route, didn't encounter any enemies, and returned. Sum shrugged taking a deep drag and starting to cough. I see. Glancing at the smoke from their rolled cigarettes, I leaned towards her, inhaling to determine the contents. But as soon as I caught the familiar sweet, slightly spicy scent, all apathy and indifference were washed away by irritation and anger. Sum, where did you get this stuff? I asked calmly, deciding first to find out where they got the narcotics before starting to twist necks and give people a whack on the head. Huh? A familiar Jonin treated us and said it's very relaxing, Ishii replied. And by the way, he was right. It's really effective. Yeah, it helps. His neighbor chimed in. 
taking a deep breath and channeling my anger towards these juvenile idiots. I swiftly reached out and snatched the rolled cigarettes from the trio, promptly extinguishing them with a small splash of water. Hey! Ignoring their dissatisfaction, I gave them a stern look. Do you know what exactly you were smoking just now? Some herb from Kusa. Some answered, frowning. More precisely, it's a narcotic herb from Kusagakir, which, besides relaxing the body, also significantly slows down the reaction time of the smoker for at least another day and a half. I said, suppressing idiots with weak chakra. A jonin's body will cleanse itself overnight practically without consequences, but you're risking seriously diminishing your chances of survival the next day if you encounter an enemy. So, quickly get out all your supplies and hand them over to me. The smokers, slightly pale and realizing they had almost dug their own graves with their own hands, silently rummaged in their pockets and pulled out their rolled cigarettes, confiscating them and tucking them into my medical kit. Skillfully, this herb could be turned into a good pain-relieving medicine. I sighed. I understand you're tired and worn out, but I won't let you ruin yourselves with drugs. After all, even alcohol isn't as harmful as this junk. I've seen enough of these in the hospital back in my day. Find other ways to relax or smoke normal tobacco, it's definitely less harmful. After my irritated tirade, everyone remained silent for a while, but eventually nodded in agreement. How are you holding up? Sum asked. Exhausted like hell? But it seems like there's going to be less work now. I cracked my neck. If IWA doesn't decide to try us again by knocking out patrols first, I might even be able to run around with you, leaving Shifuyu to handle the hospital. MMM. And we fell silent again, watching the flames dance in the campfire. All right, we're going to sleep. Ishii announced after 10 minutes, exchanging glances with her neighbor. Good night. I nodded. Watching the pair head off to one tent together, I smirked. Managed to find myself a girl here, forgetting about my first crush in the Huga clan. So it goes. I'm so tired. Some muttered, leaning against my shoulder. This isn't at all how I imagined my career. As if they asked for our opinion before sending us here. I snorted. Even though they talk about the war ending soon and making peace with the Wagakure, we're going to be stuck here for a while. That's what I'm afraid of. My partner sighed. If it's already this crappy after four months of war, what will happen next? And what about those who've been fighting for a long time? Well, don't compare yourself to veterans who are 10 or 15 years older. I chuckled. We're basically fresh out of the sandbox and straight into war. It's lucky it wasn't in full swing or we'd be toast. As for those who've been fighting for a long time, well, they're sitting around with empty eyes. So hang in there at least for the sake of returning to those waiting for us at home. I hugged the Kunoichi and patted her shoulder reassuringly. Home. I want to go home too. To a soft bed. To bathe in a real bath. To eat normal food instead of the stupid camp stove meal. My partner whispered softly. Home? I want that too. But who's going to let us go? It seems like just recently I left the village and already miss Saya, who always wants to do something and sticks her nose everywhere, Mito and little Kushina, and that cheerful and cozy leanly, I snapped out of my thoughts only when the first drops of rain started to fall from the cloud-covered night sky, and the campfire had nearly burned out. Glancing at Tsum, I found that she had fallen asleep, leaning against my side with her head on my shoulder. And to think, not long ago she didn't think of me as a friend or even a comrade. Looking at her relaxed face now, she still seems like such a young girl. It's the perfect time to start looking at boys, getting interested in clothes and parties instead of killing people. Sighing, I stood up from the ground, holding her shoulders with my right hand and lifting her legs with my left. Easily carrying the Kunoichi slight figure, I brought her to the tent under the watchful eye of the dog, and then in the intensified rain, I headed towards the infirmary. I still have work to do before I can go to sleep, and I need to let the assistants go. They didn't set up their tents nearby like I did. After all, who wants to listen to the moans of the wounded even at night? But I'm used to it. So, now that everyone's here, let's begin. The commander surveyed those assembled. The not-so-spacious room of the local headquarters was packed with a large number of people, and the last few had just arrived in time for the meeting. 
Among the gathered shinobi and kunoichi, there wasn't a single chunin besides myself, and there was a very serious reason for that. There was a massive offensive planned very soon. At least, that was evident from the rumors circulating among the latest arrivals. No one knew anything specific, but preparations were underway at the main camp. Perhaps the local leadership was in the know. Not everyone kept quiet about it. Meiho had gathered the main striking force here to brief them on the command's plans for the front. Firstly, for those who aren't aware, headquarters is planning a full-scale attack across the entire front. So we'll have to join in on the fun, Iki informed those gathered. Is there some specific plan? Or are we just supposed to charge blindly? One of the Jounin asked. This time, reconnaissance managed to sniff out the location of Iwa's nearest camp and even some of their outposts with approximate trap placements on approach, the commander replied. So, we have only one task, level that camp to the ground or at least prevent them from joining their main forces. And how are we going to accomplish that? It's our problem, added Itami Inazuka, his deputy. The estimated number of enemy? About 300, plus or minus a few dozen. And we're supposed to do this with 50 Jounin? The losses will be too great. Will there be reinforcements from the main camp? Even if we take all the Chunin except the injured, it's still 300 against our 200. After such a statement, the shinobi started to murmur slightly excitedly, mostly in a negative tone. Considering their long participation in high-ranking combat operations, everyone was simply exhausted, and the news of another bloody battle in the near future did not inspire anyone. Yeah, this setup doesn't look very good, but according to reconnaissance, there are about 15 Jounin among those 300, and half of them are Jenin. Meho grimaced. 50 strong fighters should be enough. Yeah, losing half our force, grumbled someone nearby, and I found myself nodding in agreement. During my time in the war, I had the opportunity to assess the strengths of both enemies and allies. After all, just a few months ago, the situation would have been even worse, so we should be grateful rather than outraged. Itami shrugged, cutting off the grumbling of those gathered. Anyway, we're setting out tomorrow evening to attack the camp closer to dawn, after eliminating all the outposts. The commander rubbed his face tiredly. On the bright side, headquarters has assigned five Huga to assist us. Considering that all our own have been killed or seriously wounded, this timely assistance... At least now we won't have to rely solely on the Aburane beetles and the scent-tracking mean dogs of Inazuka to search for camouflaged observation points and traps. With five clans of excellent trackers and sensors, Hyuga, Inazuka, Aburame, Yamanaka, and Uchiha, Kanahagakur has never needed a training program for ordinary sensors, which has caused our forces to suffer in reconnaissance whenever the number of shinobi on the front lines from these clans begins to decline. Our allies from Kuzugakure have also assigned a dozen of their Jounin for the attack. Considering that there's another camp like this on grass territory, it's quite a large number for a small village of assassins, whose armed forces barely count a thousand fighters, the majority of whom are Jenin at academy level. We won't be moving altogether, but in small groups of about ten people, each accompanied by a Hyuga and a couple of ally Jounin. Iki continued his briefing. Teams will receive radios for communication from me and weapon kits from the arsenal for their subordinates. He pointed at five Jounin and his assistant handed them lists with the names of their group's fighters. Now, concerning our sole worthy medical need, the commander found me with his eyes, modestly huddled in the corner of the room, but given my size, I stood head and shoulders above most of those gathered, making it hard to miss. I'm listening. Ryo-san, your task is extremely simple. Follow our main forces under the protection of several shinobi and set up a field hospital before the assault. Understood. Actually, this isn't our first outing like this, though this time it's much larger in scale than previous ones. Thanks to my knowledge of Fuinjutsu and having sealing scrolls, I could deploy a field hospital literally instantly and cover it with an impenetrable barrier capable of withstanding even A-rank techniques, not to mention weaker ones, guaranteeing exceptional safety for all wounded on the battlefield especially considering my ability to handle almost any ordinary Jounin from IWA one-on-one. -on -one. While I didn't participate in patrols and combat outings as often as my comrades, the ones I did participate in were enough for gradual experience gain and skill honing. Moreover, in most cases they made sure to protect me, 
despite the efforts of enemies to eliminate the team sensor and discovered Irionine first and foremost. Anyway, that's all, except for group commanders. Everyone is free and can rest until tomorrow, Mido concluded. Shrugging, I peeled off the wall and stretched towards the exit along with everyone else. Hey, Ryo, what do you think about this offensive? Turning around, I saw the familiar face of my clanmate, Tova Nara, a Jounin Tokubetsu five years my senior who had only arrived in our camp a month ago. Given his rather industrious character compared to most of the lazy clan members and some restlessness, we immediately found common ground despite a significant age difference. Most likely, solid reinforcements have arrived from Kanoha, so headquarters decided to use the advantage in strength to make IWA reconsider the advisability of continuing hostilities in this part of the front. I replied after a brief thought. We won't be able to crush them completely for another couple of years anyway, but forcing them to make peace is quite possible. Do you think the old fart Anoki will agree? It all depends on the effectiveness of the upcoming offensive, and time will tell. I sighed, slowly heading towards the field hospital. In any case, we'll be stuck here for a while longer, and I don't think the war will end right away, though it might calm down a bit. Perhaps, the Jounin Tokabetsu agreed. By the way, have you heard the latest rumors? What? About the Hokage students? They say they clashed with Hanzo himself in Amige Cure. With Hanzo? Oops, there's a familiar episode for me already. Yeah, with him. And they so impressed the old man that he not only let them go alive, but also gave the title of Densetsu no Sanin. So, it wasn't that they managed to escape from Hanzo Salamander, but he let them go? Not such a great achievement, if you ask me. I shrugged. Now if they had one, considering that out of 400 shinobi who clashed with such a monster, they were the only ones who survived, it's certainly an achievement. The guy snorted. The others couldn't even do that. I think against shinobi of such power, practically anyone would be helpless to oppose them. Giant summons are not possessed by every high-level fighter, not to mention the necessary amount of chakra to summon a boss during a battle. Yeah, I've heard that the salamander boss is the largest summoning animal in the world, even bigger than Gamabuntasama and Mandasama. Maybe. Thanks for the rumors. I'm going to rest before the mission, since last week was the last time I slept properly. Sure, I'll go too. Waving to my comrade, I reached my tent and collapsed wearily onto the futon. Ahead lay almost a day of recovery, which should be enough time for me. But unexpected news knocked me off balance. Amidst all this war, I had already forgotten to keep track of the key events in this world's history. What should happen next? Navaki's death and then Dan's? Specific details were never mentioned, but it should happen after the battle in AIM. So, Jiraiya's training of the three orphans should begin if they still appear. Damn! It would have been such a convenient moment to eliminate Rinnegan from the game, if I had the opportunity to stay in the village. After all, an enhanced shadow clone with sensor abilities can not only find Uzumaki's chakra but also defeat an untrained lad. The main thing is to correctly apply the stabilizing chakra structure seal. Alas, the chance was screwed up thanks to the old monkey who sent another reinforcement to the front, including me. Unpleasant. Once I return to the village, I'll try to adapt the seal for Kagebunshins simply as a reserve for the future. In the worst case, I can try to create clones based on material substances, there are prisoners for experiments, and I have the theory and execution of two excellent jutsu that achieve a similar effect. The main thing is to replace direct control of the body with the use of a clone and suppress the carrier. Ideally, even push out the previous body owner and replace them with a clone, somewhat like Orochimaru did when changing bodies. Then I'll have a source of influence beyond Kanahigakur no Sato, capable of achieving goals independently, without exposing my skin to unnecessary danger. After all, it's not up to me personally to reduce the number of Ne'es when Danzo starts systematically breaking his mannequins into emotionless dolls. This way, one or even two strong shinobi, not belonging to any village, may appear, and Ryo Nara will have nothing to do with it. Quite an attractive thought, but it requires careful elaboration and specific knowledge, some of which are not yet available. The snake Sanin has not yet embarked on his experiments or has just started thinking about it. 
If only I could approach some Jutsu Notorious for Kato Dan. There was something about him, but the source of knowledge is unclear, despite Chosa knowing about it. Hmm. I should dig through the Hokage's library again or the public section for Jonin's in Kanoha. Apparently, this technique is dangerous for the user, so it may fall into the category of forbidden techniques. And I haven't even asked anyone. Too dangerous, if I reveal my interest in such matters, even as a clan member, I could easily be pigeonholed into research groups for the benefit of the village. After a good rest over the past day, the strongest shinobi and kunoichi in the camp gathered at the western gate, awaiting orders to deploy. Among them was me, loaded with absolutely necessary items for the field hospital. Of course, I don't mean a huge bag of things, but a pile of scrolls, though my field backpack was packed to the brim with them. I've already said goodbye to Rotaro and Tsum, so leaning against the stone wall surrounding our outpost, I lazily surveyed my colleagues. There was no outright nervousness among anyone, as everyone present had participated in numerous large-scale operations, but the atmosphere of nervous tension was palpable. The grim faces of the remaining Chunin didn't help set a positive mood either. Ultimately, if enemies were to attack during our absence, defending ourselves without the support of strong shinobi would be very difficult, despite our fighters having a qualitative advantage. What personally reassured me in this situation was the opportunity not to get involved in the meat grinder along with everyone else. My role is small, setting up a hospital and patching up the wounded brought under slight protection. And they wouldn't have let me go to the front line. Ikisan can't afford to lose the only decent medic out of 200 people. Despite having control over my chakra and almost balancing the yin and yang components, my ability to suppress chakra emission remains at the level of an average chunin, and skilled enemy sensors can detect me immediately. One of the downsides of having a large reserve of denser chakra than other users. Although it's an excellent result for a member of the Uzumaki clan, whose control in their early years was simply appalling compared to other clans. You could say that with my abnormally high amount of yin energy, I am an anomaly among redheads. Nara-san? A voice interrupted me from the right. Yes. I turned my head to look at the shinobi who had interrupted my thoughts. It turned out to be a fairly elderly jonin by shinobi standards, typical in appearance for the fire country, with dark hair and eyes, a nose that had been broken several times, and a thin white scar running across his right eyebrow. Ichiya Gabashi, they've assigned me as your guard during the operation, he informed me. Nice to meet you, I nodded, shaking his outstretched hand. What's the plan? Since he's been appointed as my guard, he surely knows the details of the attack and my role in it. We're moving out 20 minutes after all the squads and following them at a certain distance, the Jonin said, leaning against the wall in a similar manner. The plan is to leave the wounded behind during the patrol sweeps and secrets clearing, and you'll need to patch them up to an acceptable state, either leaving them nearby or sending them back to the main groups. Considering that each of these groups consists of 12 strong fighters, I don't anticipate any problems with the clearing, but just in case, I brought along the scroll gifted by Mito, where we can seal severely wounded until the appropriate moment. Understood. I was about to ask him about communication devices, whether we were equipped with radios, but the arriving commander didn't allow me to. Teams 1 and 5, move forward on the designated route and clear all patrols. Mado immediately began issuing instructions. Teams 2, 3, and 4 on backup, move out. The shinobi rushed forward, leaping over the wall, and within a couple of seconds, only I remained in place with my guard while the swiftly departing cluster of chakra sources gradually became much less noticeable. One could only envy their ability to conceal their reserves so well. If I were in their place, even the worst sensor wouldn't have noticed anything at a distance of 300 meters. And right now, the colleagues moving away felt more like Chunin to me than Jonin, except the density of sources seemed higher than usual. I suppose we can start moving quietly too, Ichiya decided. I don't mind, I shrugged. After jumping over the wall, we initially moved west for some time, following a meticulously memorized path through the labyrinth of traps about 500 meters from the camp, after which we turned north and, wading through the tall grass up to our necks, gradually began to make a large arc northward. Of course, one could try to escape from the northeast side, but not even the hardiest shinobi would dare such a move if they wanted to live a little longer. And there's a good reason for it. 
Unlike the western direction where there is at least one safe path, all other directions are so densely packed with various mechanical traps, seals, and other deadly devices that not even a Hugo would risk such a suicidal act as crossing several hundred meters from the camp walls in other directions. Not to mention that any reinforcements or supply deliveries are escorted exclusively by a person from the camp, as was the case with me. From the outside, it's not particularly noticeable, but remembering my arrival here, it becomes clear that we deliberately chose certain paths when making our way to the fortified post, specifically from the west. Twenty minutes later, as the evening sky began to darken, finally losing the last remnants of light from the sun that had set beyond the horizon, my escort received a message over the radio, and we had to hasten our pace, slipping through the dense vegetation of Kusa no Kuni to the northeast. I had to channel a solid flow of chakra to my eyes just to see well enough in the darkness and react in time to any threats. Unfortunately, the land of grass is famous not only for its variety of plant life used for making excellent medicines for almost any illness or the deadliest plant poisons but also for its wildlife, namely hundreds of species of snakes that love to hide in the grass, lying in wait for their prey or nesting in such terrain. Suffice it to say that one-seventh of all my patients are victims of snake bites. Despite all my superhuman abilities, most Chunin lose to the speed of a snake strike, unable to dodge the swift attacks of these venomous creatures. However, snakes are not only a significant source of trouble for local residents, but also a means to diversify the diet of soldiers stuck with unappetizing army rations. After all, not everyone has enough money to stock up on ready-made meals for even a few months ahead, like I did. And you can't have enough scrolls unless you know how to make them yourself. Speaking of scrolls, Kusagakir no Sato, besides poisons and medicines, also supplies excellent paper for users of Fuinjutsu, second only to products from the Senju clan. And their ink, squeezed from a special type of grass, is surpassed only by the ink supplied from Mizu no Kuni in terms of its ability to retain infused chakra. In general, it's not surprising that I occasionally sent a clone to the village to procure supplies, not just provisions. Narasan, we should pick up the pace. The Jonin informed me after half an hour of light jogging. Our forces have encountered the first patrols of a Wagakure no Sato, and there are wounded. How many and what are the nature of the injuries? I asked immediately, increasing my pace. Two, light injuries but capable of affecting the combat effectiveness of the shinobi if left without immediate assistance. Narasan, Kabashi replied, easily keeping up with me. They will stay behind and wait for us. Hmm. And won't we pass by them in the darkness? Don't worry. I'll indicate the location of the wounded as soon as we're nearby, reassured my companion. Ah, uh, it seems I not only have an experienced Jonin as my partner but also a sensor. Not bad. Quite impressive, actually. And in connection with this, I have a small request, Narasan. He suddenly continued. Could you please mask your chakra as best as possible? We're about to approach the main group, and there's a significant chance that enemy sensors might detect you before they can be eliminated, with all the ensuing consequences. I'll try, Gabashi-san, but considering the amount of chakra I have, it won't be so simple. I sighed, recalling the rules of propriety. Even a little improvement would be better than now. Despite your attire hindering a proper assessment of your chakra levels and creating a dampening effect. Nodding understandingly, I grimaced, there are several ways to achieve the desired result. The most effective, though not the most rational for a combat-ready shinobi, is slowing down the chakra production from its source in the Kirikukiai. Less emission means less detectable chakra. In fact, 90% of shinobi use this method precisely for long-term concealment of their presence. Ideally, masters can completely halt chakra production, with the existing amount circulating through the Kirikuki eye channels without pushing out into the environment, making the shinobi practically invisible to the majority of sensors. This method is also the main reason why battling shinobi tend to be talkative and why there is a slow increase in the levels of applied jutsu. During this time, the source gets charged up. However, very few can achieve such a perfect result. Among the armed forces of the village, Orochimaru is considered closest to this ideal due to the bonuses he receives from his contract. Unfortunately, this method doesn't suit Uzumaki due to the large amount of chakra produced and the need for control over the energies of body and mind, which requires even more precise control. Of course, this applies to me to a lesser extent, 
but only a newly graduated genin can achieve a similar result. Moreover, it's not wise to lose the ability to use jutsu that require a large amount of chakra without proper support behind you. The second method is somewhat simpler but at the same time more problematic. It involves a jonin forcibly blocking the passage of chakra through all tenketsu, becoming invisible to sensors. However, the increasing pressure in a filled kirikukiai prevents using this method indefinitely, especially with a full reserve, and more than one fool has damaged their chakra channels and tenketsu in this way, losing the ability to use jutsu for an extended period. Moreover, this method requires excellent control but loses efficiency due to my Uzumaki heritage. For us, it's even more complicated due to the increased number of tenketsu in the kirikukiai. Red-haired sealing masters have never made good spies. Deciding to ease my own efforts a bit, I created a shadow clone with a decent reserve of chakra and only then blocked the tenketsu. Or rather, I tried to do so, because I simply couldn't concentrate on everything simultaneously. Tracking the surroundings and carefully navigating through the uneven terrain at night. So mostly, I blocked the tenketsu that emitted chakra into the open space, rather than absorbed by seals on my clothing. Not so easy to hide with a full reserve, I explained in response to the Jonin's questioning glance. One thing to envy is the absence of such problems for Kage Bunshin. Fake clones emit chakra in the same quantity as the original, but they don't increase pressure in the Kirikukiai, as the clone has a limited chakra volume. And it doesn't matter where it is circulating in the Kirikukiai or stored in the source, there won't be changes in pressure on the Tenketsu. Thus the disguise will be much better than the original. Following the main offensive forces practically all night was uneventful except for changes in terrain to more rocky areas instead of grassy hills. Five teams easily dealt with all encountered enemies with the help of Hyuga, not allowing anyone to escape. My task remained mostly to treat unlucky Shinobi and Kunoichi who received injuries, sending them back or, in some cases, sealing them in scrolls to save time. But there were only three of the latter against two dozen lightly injured. Nevertheless, more than a dozen strong fighters can handle any patrol, traditionally consisting of three Chunin teams led by one Jonin in Iwagakure. There were no lethal outcomes at all, though it should be noted that injuries gradually began to diminish over time. Fighting together, the soldiers became accustomed to each other in field conditions and gradually made fewer dangerous mistakes, easing my work. In the end, as the groups of Jonin approached at dawn to the mostly sleeping camp, they found themselves short of just four people, with another seven held in reserve, deemed unfit for the imminent assault. Tipping the scales in our favor at the right moment. Yes, fully engaging in battle with hastily treated wounds? Not so much. While the Iwagakure Shinobi camp was surrounded and obstacles like traps and sentries were cleared, two kilometers southwest, I prepared a mobile hospital at a pre-agreed point with the commander, simultaneously monitoring developments with my abilities. Unfolding a large tent, stocking necessary medications, setting up places for the wounded, installing a small belt of activated traps just in case, preparing the main defensive barrier around the tent and another attacking defensive type slightly larger. In general, doing everything to avoid additional losses if the enemy suddenly discovered us. About 40 minutes later, a lone explosion suddenly thundered. Someone must have failed to bypass a trap and chaos erupted. No longer hiding and ignoring the defensive measures of the waking camp, the forces from Kanoha unleashed waves of substantial firepower techniques from all sides on the enemy, quickly demolishing quite high and thick walls almost instantly. Even with full concentration, I couldn't discern clear pictures of what was happening due to the rising chakra storm used by combatants on both sides. Two substantial sources of chakra clashed and in a moment one began to rapidly fade while the other leaped forward and fell under a cloud of techniques, disappearing from the radar screen. Three clashed and only one survived. The collisions of techniques concealed sensations from numerous chakra points, some of which reappeared, while all others vanished. In the distance, only the thunder of explosions and the rumbling of colliding rocks were heard, mixed with cries of pain and rage carried by the wind even to us. And soon, I had my first patient, a couple of chakra points detached from the battle scene and swiftly headed our way. Nara-san, wounded, notified the Jonin. As if I wouldn't know, stepping out from under the tent, I waited for the first of many wounded. 
after about 10 seconds, in the incorrect light of the risen moon and stars, from the direction of the destroyed camp appeared the figure of a person jumping among the rocks, dragging another on their back. Without a word, one of the previously patched up shinobi dumped the injured comrade into my arms and dashed back. Already carrying the unconscious guy with a kunai handle sticking out of his side, I sensed the imminent arrival of another. Next came a stream of casualties from the tense skirmish, so neither I nor the created clones had time to monitor the surroundings. Therefore, after a ten-minute distraction from my work, the concerned voice of Gabashi came as a complete surprise. Narasan will have guests soon, creating another clone and assigning it to treat the injured Kunoichi. I stepped out onto the street. Guests. However, I didn't need an answer to that question, feeling to the south of us a group of people with a considerable chakra reserve. Yes. Ten people are approaching the camp right through our location, and we'll be here in a couple of minutes. Damn. Just what I needed on top of everything else. Time was slipping through my fingers swiftly, and I pondered possible courses of action for no more than a second. Grimacing, I popped two chakra-recovering pills into my mouth and created four clones from half of the remaining reserve, then signaled to my partner to retreat to the camp, paying no mind to the purple barrier that appeared above the tent, which the copies had erected to protect the wounded. It'll hold for about twenty minutes even against the most costly techniques. I reassured the Jonin, throwing a worried glance back. Of course, if it's a dozen high-level enemies, the lifespan of such protection will be significantly shorter. But among these unexpected guests, there's hardly anyone of that level. A standard trio of Jonin and two squads of Chunin with one who seems like a scout judging by the flickering chakra source and its occasional disappearance. In general, nothing particularly frightening, but it'll be enough for us considering that the skirmish in Iwa's camp is still ongoing. However, they're rushing too much to reach their comrades, giving us an opportunity to arrange a small surprise potentially capable of having the number of new enemies. Without wasting words, I explained the plan to Gabashi with a couple of dozen signs and was pleased that there was no usual cloud cover for this time of year, which typically obscures the moon and deprives the Nara of the shadows so necessary for their techniques. We found a suitable spot on top of one of the hills just 200 meters from the main battle site, not so close to fall under the hot hand of the scattered Jonin or to catch a random technique to the forehead, but relatively close for a hasty retreat if things go worse than expected. Creating two more clones for cover and sadly noting a loss of nine-tenths of the chakra source and only just starting pills, I settled in the shadow of a large rock on the hill, folding my hands into the concentration seal. Even the keenest I wouldn't immediately distinguish my figure in such a place, and we needed just a couple of seconds. And judging by the trajectory of the movement of the dozen shinobi, they should emerge right where we are. How long can you hold? The jonin next to me even applied henge to blend into the rock's color before asking about the available time, tracking how almost imperceptible threads connected shadows from the stones in a small hollow, creating a real network that could only be noticed when you precisely knew what to look for. 10 to 15 seconds, no more, I replied, finishing the trap and noting a considerable chakra loss to maintain even such a small area of my own technique. After all, activating the natural shadows of large volumes is always costly. Maybe even 15 seconds is too optimistic for such a large number of targets. I still need some chakra reserve to avoid collapsing from exhaustion during the pursuit of survivors, but nobody was going to give me time to worry. A hostile chakra source approached closely, and I saw with my own eyes the silhouettes of a Wagakure shinobi, leaping at maximum speed over a low stone ridge and ending up exactly where we had calculated. Amplifying the chakra flow tenfold, going into the Hizutsu, I managed to stop the bodies that had accelerated, albeit dropping about a tenth of the remaining reserve. Nimpo, Kage main no jutsu, and not a moment later, my clones sprang into action, chasing the one shinobi who hadn't fallen into my net, leaping far aside, while my partner rushed downhill, generously scattering Kanai at motionless targets. In the next moment, the enemy realized they were being attacked, and I had to double my efforts to restrain all nine people who began making frenzied efforts to escape the shadow trap. Fifteen seconds. Here, a dozen would suffice. With a barely audible sound, a pair of Kanai entered the necks of the nearest figures, and on the fly, Gabashi threw the next ones, leaping until I released the bodies, even a fatally wounded chakra user can fight for some time as if healthy, albeit only for a few seconds, 
and rushing towards the main targets who had so unsuccessfully shielded the Chunin. By the third second, there were already four corpses, and by the fourth, five. The fifth second forced my partner to spend it on the last Chunin, as his neck was protected by something more substantial than just a layer of clothing. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.